Hello and welcome to EAJ Today. My name is Gerhard Hendricks. I'm here in Davos, Switzerland, and we talk about genetics, genetics in cardiomyopathies. You may say, oh, wow, this is to too difficult for me to follow, but you will see that we have somebody here with us who will explain everything around the field of genetics and cardiomyopathy. Very, very understandable. It's Perry Elliott from University of London who is with us here today. Perry, welcome to EHA today. And we're going to discuss the field of genetics and cardiomyopathies. S setting the stage, what is the role of genetics in the field of cardiomyopathies? Okay, so I think the, taking the, the cue from your introduction, you know, we make genetics very complicated. But I think what we've been trying to do for more than two decades is just to get cardiologists thinking in a different way about not only cardiomyopathy, but in fact all cardiac disease. Because every day in our clinics we see genetic disease. So what we want people to do is from that moment you make that diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, the next question you ask yourself is, could this be genetic? And if it is genetic, what are the implications for the person sitting there in front of me? And perhaps even more importantly, what are the implications for their family? So it's, it's a mindset, really. So keeping things simple and, and quite practical, you have a patient in, in your uh, <coughs> office and you have evidence for the diagnosis of, let's say, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's first-time diagnosis. Then you have to immediately link mind-wise to the field of genetics, what would be the next reasonable steps to go into that field? So the, the first and simplest step is to actually take a good family history, to actually draw a family pedigree. That's something as cardiologists we're never taught to do. Uh, it takes a good 15 to 20 minutes to do it properly. But by simply describing a family, describing the disease that may be present in that family, looking for what we refer to as red flags, you know, signs, symptoms, events, which indicate not only the presence of a genetic disease, but sometimes what the underlying etiology for that disease may be. So of all the steps that one can take, that first family history, pedigree analysis, is probably the most important. So that's a very, very important uh, <coughs> message. So you don't go as the initial step into expensive genetic testings. You talk to the patient, you carefully listen to the patient, and you take a diagram of the, the family tree in order to identify uh, people, patients that may have the same problem. W once you've done that, what's the next reasonable step? So then I think you're, you're moving to, onto the characterization of the phenotype. I think all too often in clinical practice, cardiologists will make the diagnosis of hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy and the, the thought process stops there. But the next question they should ask themselves is, okay, can I detect some signs or symptoms or can I interpret the usual tests, the electrocardiogram, the echocardiogram, the MRI, with this cardiomyopathy mindset? Are there red flags here which tell me what the underlying genetic cause may be? So something very simple, you know, a, a history of atrioventricular block. Such an important red flag in heart muscle disease. You know, if you have dilated cardiomyopathy, you may be looking at myocarditis. You may be looking at laminopathy. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, probably three or four different genes which present with early AV block. In the older patient, the patient who has clear hypertrophy on their scan, and yet the voltage on the ECG is relatively low. Amyloidosis. You know, just using these simple clues to help you hone down on a specific diagnosis, if you can. So when you have explored the patient uh, clinically, you have done the basic uh, uh, investigations, taken ECG, taken echocardiogram, taken an MRI, you have the first impression on potential possible genetic links. What is the best moment to go into genetic testing and do you go specifically into uh, a, a direction where you suspect something or is it like a screening you look for everything? So I think if you have red flags which point you in a particular direction you test there first. So if you think this in an adolescent for example this could be Noonan syndrome you test for that. If you find no red flags which 
is probably the case in the majority of patients. Mm -hmm. You then go for the commonest genes that cause that phenotype. But you only do genetic testing when you've done one other very important step, which is to do genetic counselling. What are the implications of a genetic test for this individual? And what are the implications of a genetic test for their family? Because once you've done the test, you have a result, you have a result and it's too late. You can't go back from that. So you, you need to understand what the implications of that might be. It's, that's very important. I mean, you know, I'm an uh, interventional electrophysiologist, and it's in a, in a way it's the same. Before you do an EP study and you induce VF, you need to make up your mind, what are you going to do with it? And you, you have to go into this investigation on purpose, and it's the same with, with genetic uh, testing. Um, looking a little bit to the field of uh, risk stratification and genetic testing, what's your current perspective in cardiomyopathies? So I think with very few exceptions, knowing the genotype doesn't make a great deal of difference to the clinical assessment of risk. There are some examples where it does. For example, if you take laminopathy, you know, lamin is relatively common, maybe 5 to 8% of dilated cardiomyopathy. From the information that we have, it seems to be associated with a very high incidence of sudden cardiac death. So once the phenotype is developing, the threshold for a defibrillator in that circumstance it should be lower than it would be in other patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. But most of the time, it doesn't influence things that much. We're, we're still very dependent on clinical risk markers and integration of those, those risk markers. Mm -hmm. If we look to the future, uh, Perry, yeah. the next uh, three to five years, do you expect major breakthroughs in the field of genetics uh, and cardiomyopathies? Yeah, so I've, I've been saying that for 20 years, that we're on the, we're on the edge of a, of a breakthrough. I think genuinely we are now, um, because I think the technology has, is such that sequencing is no longer a problem. It's, it's a commercial consideration now. You can get a whole genome done at relatively low cost. What we re now have to do is to take that data and understand it. And I think the, the future is going to be integrating genetic data with phenotype, with proteomics, biomarkers, to see if we can see patterns, you know, clusters of phenotypes. I think there are, there's an enormous interest now in, in the pharmacological industry about developing gene therapies, targeting therapies to specific mutations. And I, I think we will see that in the next five years. We're already seeing it. So genotyping, I think, will become really important in designing therapy for individuals. For the moment, in 2015, three take-home messages for the clinician from the field of uh, genetics in cardiomyopathies. First of all, think about it. So you see someone with heart muscle disease, could this be genetic? I think the second would be to look more broadly at the phenotype. You know, look at the family history. Look, at, look for red flags that point you in a particular direction. So take your time, take your talk time. and listen think, carefully. Think like a cardiomyopathy doctor. Okay. You know, what, what is the cause of this disease? And I, and I think the third is think before you leap. You know, when you're dealing with genetic disease, you, you're, not a, you're not treating an individual, you're treating a family. And I think you have to think about the ramifications of that diagnosis for those around the patient. As cardiologists, we want to save lives, so we screen family members. But you can cause harm by doing that. You know, step by step, systematic, um, you know, I say, think like a cardiomyopathy doctor. <laughs> <laughs> great. Barry, thanks a lot for this great interview. Thank, Thank you. you.